Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Shundine Brown, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Native American Art here at the RISD Museum. And I'm really excited to welcome you to one of the lectures we're doing for the Spring 2023-2024 Indigenous and First Nation Lecture Series. Um, and this is generously sponsored by the Rhode Island School of Design Center for Social Equity and Inclusion. So thank you to SEI. Um, and today we're going to welcome Michaela Patton as our visiting lecturer. Earlier in this series this year, we welcomed Peter G. Jemison. Um, so I'm excited to have Michaela here today. Um, so Michaela Patton is an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota Nation and mixed media artist. Through the interplay of recycled paper making and earth elements, she creates sculptural objects that explore indigenous intimacies, personal narratives, and the transformative power of repurposing materials. While utilizing her Lakota knowledge of creative methodologies and adornment, she aims to address shared themes of healing, growth, and renewal. In 2019, she obtained her BFA with a focus in printmaking from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Her work is exhibited at the Texas Tech School of Art in Lubbock, Texas, All My Relations Gallery in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. She's been mentioned in Hand Papermaking Magazine, First American Art, and Pesa Tiempo. She's received fellowships, awards, and residencies through the Roswell ARI program, UCross Foundation, the studios at Mass Mocha, First People's Fund, and Native Arts and Culture Foundation. She is currently living and working on the East Coast and is represented by Siakiskura Contemporary Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and a special thanks to Professor Dwayne Slick, Professor Angela Baca, and Mia Nilo, and everyone at SEI for sponsoring this event. Um, it's been really great to have folks on campus and welcome them not only to the stage here, but to the studios and individual departments as well as the museum. So without further ado, welcome Michaela. I'm gonna drink some water first. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, and thank you for being here. Uh, before I get started, uh, I want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to the RISD community and staff for welcoming me. A special thanks to Duane Slick for inviting me to be a part of the Indigenous First Peoples uh, and, um, sorry, uh, the Indigenous and First Nations Artists Lecture Series and Shandine Brown for guiding me around the campus and um, touring me around and inviting me to the collection. Uh, thank you. Uh, in my talk, modes of material embedded, stitched, and vesseled. I am honored to share with all of you the last five years of work that has brought me here. <clears throat> this creative journey will begin with my, my background, formal training and communal teachings, along with my current studio practice and specific works that have shaped, my, my pra uh, shaped this practice. This will un uncover the themes and questions that drive my creative process. Again, my name is Michaela Patton. My great grandma, my great grandma uh, Ida Waters, gave me the Lakota name Ampa Kazanzawin, which means daylight woman or born of the day. This is me and my grandma. Um, I was born and raised on the Pine Ridge Reservation in Western South Dakota. I am Lakota and I come from the Ogla Lakota people. My education comes from all kinds of places, including boarding school. My family does not have an art background, but I consider my great grandma an artist who used her, what she learned in boarding school and applied it to sewing, making her own means. This will stick with me in my early work as I had to na navigate my own means. To touch more on the, the, on the context of my cultural background, I have 
I have to acknowledge the deeply spiritual people I stem from and th- how that gives me gives shape to my work. As a Lakota person, I do not speak for all Lakota people nor all Native people. In the spaces I grew up in, I listen to elders speak on the responsibilities we, ha- we are born with and in my personal life have worked hard to not only understand that but, but also heal through it. I am not a storyteller, but I am a listener of stories, and my people's origin stories tell us that we emerged, that Lakota people have emerged from Wind Cave in the Black Hills of present-day South Dakota. Through generations of stories and knowledge keepers, we understand that there is a larger interconnected relationship between cosmos and land, which brings me to the stories that I have personally grown up with and how these stories always contain non-human ex- experiences and interactions. I like the way the Lakota artist Susan Kite puts it, the seen unseen, physical non-physical, and animal non-animal. Uh, I am a multidisciplinary visual artist working through sculpture and installation. My practice brings together materiality and intimacy. Uh, my work focuses on paper as the main material of my sculptures while including various natural elements and processes. I collect and combine uh, often indigenous informed articles such as glass beads, porcupine quills, leather, fabric scraps, sinew, plant dyes, inks, and more. My work is fueled by my own understanding and knowledge of Lakota adornment practices, intergenerational sustainability, methodologies, archiving, and being. Through an indigenous lens, my, my work often address, addresses shared themes of healing, growth, and renewal. Further in my work, I am continuously learning about femme-rooted practices of making as well as the materials that inform them. In 2019, I obtained my Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Studio Arts, focusing on printmaking from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. IAI fosters indigenous thinking, perspective, and traditional arts. This also includes sustainability practices and communal teachings. Through formal training experience, um, I experienced traditional mediums of painting and printmaking, but through reciprocal relationships from the community, I developed deeper knowledge around materials. This meant that I was in conversation, mainly in beading circles, about natural elements like dentelium shells and quill work. We spoke about where these elements come from, traditional trade routes, how to process them safely, including who and how different territories of people adorned their loved ones. In printmaking and later paper making, I explored cultural motifs like the the molars of elk teeth that would adorn Lakota women's dresses. The teeth were always positioned in a way that best shaped the form of the dress, in this case, the back. For example, like the piece on the left, titled Worth the Memories. This is where I also began exposing actual material on photopolymer plates and etching process in printmaking. Alongside the motifs, I worked with visual geometric language. This language, heavy in symbols, can be seen in quill work and beadwork, adornment practices rooted in indigenous communities. The work on the right specifically from a Lakota understanding is a vertebrae, representing a backbone, a a symbol associated with matriarchs, the ones who keep us up and moving forward. As a student, I struggled to stay in school consecutively, but I was able to find work as a collections intern at the Heritage Center in my community. While in the collections, I had access to cultural items, ceremonial objects, contemporary paintings, and sculptures, including art from outside of my community. 
Through this experience, I found myself drawn more to the natural materials used in moccasins, beaded suitcases, quilled garments, and adorned regalia. Surrounded by the energies of these objects, I wanted to understand who and how we make such intricate works for. I was often asking myself, how can I bring these items into contemporary spaces? How can I reimagine these objects that stem from necessity and deep appreciation of a loved one? How can I learn from them and what would they say? This work here, this specific work here um, is handmade paper um, with, print make, with a printmaking process called monotype over the paper and laser etching on top of, on top of the ink and paper. The images here I pulled from the National Museum of American Indians online archive to give you an example of the items I would later be drawn to and what would influence my work going forward. These are rawhide containers, animal skin that, that hardens and becomes strong after a laborious process. In collections and around the world, they are known as the French word parfleche, referring to the strength of the material. In Lakota, we call them wankpan, and in my own work, I call them traveling trunks, because these ones here and in my work, that's what they are used for. Lakota people once heavily relied on traveling across the Great Plains in connections with Maka, Mother Earth, specifically around the Pahasapa, aka Black Hills region. These trunks stored belongings such as clothing, food, and medicines. They were made exclusively by women and reflected abstract maps seen in dreams. I came into paper making as a student just before finishing school. This is an attempt. This was an attempt at uh, making use of the studio's scraps of paper. As a studio monitor of the printmaking studio, I spent a lot of time alone unless it was during midterms or finals. This meant that I was able to invest in exploring this medium and that it would first be paired with my printmaking background. At the time, I was using found boards, a thrift store blender, used bed sheets, and a, and a regular sink. With water and shredded paper, I made pulp. New sheets of paper would take form in, on flat beds recycled from old silk screens. Sandwiched between these found boards and the bed sheets stabled the pulp as the water was forced out. Once the paper sheet dries, I had a new sheet of paper. New and exciting to me, I could not help but think about how similar this process was to processing hide. Although I didn't have a lot of experience in this, I, I, it felt familiar. Like using every part of the animal, I was using every part of the studio. Nothing got thrown away. This particular work um, is, again, handmade paper uh, repurposed from paper scraps and included in, in the pulp is sage and tobacco mixed in, and the negative shapes were cut out with a laser machine. I began thinking about hide and traveling trunks. When, think, when looking at a hide, you can sometimes see what the animal experienced. There are marks made from bug bites, wounds, and other kinds of scarring, influenced by the marks and the motifs I worked with before. I wanted to find my own voice within them and re-envision them through different materials. Other, sorry, and different materials, other embedded and stitched and use of other tools. I use Adobe Illustrator to produce my own symbols and transfer these symbols to a laser machine that then can cut and or etch directly to the paper. This is how I am able to achieve clean cuts and etch burned layers like the designs in this piece. The designs are burned into the paper directly. Looking at the negative spaces around the designs, I utilize the laser cutting and etching on the handmade paper. This process not only highlighted the intriguing interplay between presence and absence, 
but also introduced depth to my work. I eventually, it eventually led me to transition from flat surfaces to the creation of more sculptural pieces, marking a shift in my work from 2D to 3D. This work is titled Ampo Kazazawin, which, which roughly translates to Daylight Woman or Born in the Day, my Lakota name. This is student work, but it, it made a huge difference on my direction. With my personal story of moving through different stages of my life as a way of moving forward and welcoming a new path, I worked on separate panels of paper, then assembled them with synthetic sinew. You may recognize some of the motifs from my printmaking work, like the elk teeth and the vertebrae. I use this work to pinpoint different stages of my life, starting from in infancy to at the bottom, to childhood, teen, and now adulthood at the top. The heavy symbols reflected much of what I was learning through research about traveling trunks and their personalized designs. New to this, I explored my own symbols based on what I was already seeing and reflected on my own experiences. In late 2020, my artistic journey took me to Roswell, New Mexico, where I was fortunate to embark on a year-long residency with the Roswell Artists in Residence program, RARE. This pivotal period afforded me not just focused time and space for creation, but also a supportive living environment, a stipend to sustain my practice, and the inevitable opportunity for a solo exhibition at the local Roswell Art Museum. Immersed in this small yet diverse community of artists from various corners of the globe, I found myself in an ideal setting to deepen my conceptual exploration, refine my techniques, and expand my artistic horizons. This is my studio in Roswell. I started making paper using the tools I taught myself in college and initi initiated new ideas. Eager to explore installation and large works, I began building the paper pulp up into thick layers. This meant that I would be able to make stronger structures as my work progressed into sculptural forms. I repurposed paper collected from the Roswell Artist, Artist Library, who coincidentally needed to discard books, newspapers, and research articles. I found that a majority of these research articles contained outdated and misinformation regarding indigenous peoples of North and South America. I took this as an opportunity to reframe the narrative and here, oh, sorry. In addition to the Roswell Artist Museum, um, they have a, a large collection called the Atkins Collection on permanent exhibit. Lined with large, thick glass walls, a mash of indigenous objects hang on display. The family donated over 300 items of indigenous belongings from various communities, including turn of the century weaponry and Spanish armory. Expanding my interests in collections, I spent a lot of time viewing the belongings and found myself coming back to this one dress. The beadwork was vast with bright blue and was, was what, oh, hung quietly in a corner. If you didn't stretch your view, you could probably miss it. The familial motifs, style, material, and colors told me that it was from where I'm from. A part of me wanted to save it. In 2021, the, this installation and my first solo show titled Visitation, I explored the concept of these containers as vessels for spirits engaged in silent dialogue. The paper trunks formed from the document from the document rich in language and history were transformed through my process. I stripped the original text and imbued them with new narratives through in the infusion of power motifs like the vertebrae and the elk teeth. The piercing texture of porcupine quills, the organic hues of pigments, the delicate binding of deer lace, and the reflective surfaces of glass beads. 
this act of repurposing not only breath new life into the materials, but also invites a contemplation of the stories they carry and the conversations they might hold within. This work that you're looking at, again, was made with handmade paper I collected. Um, it also included uh, plexi sheets, deer lace, uh, deer lace leather, pigments, um, porcupine quills, small glass beads, and and of course, paper. I'm gonna sh play a short audio. Oh, sorry. This is a letter that I wrote to the dress. I spent some time in the collection with this dress before hanging it up. Um, and in that process, I wrote this letter, um, which I will play the audio for. Takuya, thank you for being here. I know it's been a long time since you've been home and with relatives. There is so much I need to tell you and much more I need to remind you. Many of our young people are reviving the Lakota language in our homelands and our women's ceremonies are being held again. I brought you here because I know you need to be fed. When I first saw you, I thought about how much someone misses you, how much you're meant to be danced in, moved around, to feel alive. You don't belong here, and the worst part is, they don't even know who you belong to. Takuya, please remember that you are not from the past, you are current and rooted in generations of knowledge. Your fringe hangs tight to stories, tribal history, cosmology, our people, and me. You continue to ground me in a time I needed you most. Your lanes of beads resemble more than a shift in our existence. They are a testament to our resilience. Dancing is like making thunder. And like thunder, there is a storm coming. Um, here is the installation from the view of the dress. The vertebrae symbols that represent the backbone are present and on the face of the trunks, and including the elk teeth. Here are more detailed shots of the elk teeth on the left. Again, I was able to achieve this on the right, sorry. I was able to achieve this uh, again with laser cutting. Um, with uh, through the paper. The image on the left uh, is, a t is a top view of one of the trunks. What you're seeing on the outside is a uh, star pattern called the morning star that represents new day. And within that design in the center there um, is a directional pattern, a, a directional pattern with quill work stitched to the paper on the inside. After Roswell, I started, I started working on a small ongoing series titled Protection. Through this work, I was thinking more about how indigenous belongings, including our symbols, were taken without regard to the knowledge that lies with them. This, this is something that bothered me deeply while researching through collections. The destructive behavior of early white settlers stealing, looting, and trading meant that they can own a part of American history. 
that they can own the belongings of a quote unquote dying race, referring to indigenous people of present day America. After visitation, I hoped that these utilitarian containers can now function as protectors and where materials like porcupine quills can be used differently from the traditional uh, quill work practices. This small series will influence the next installation and gradually shift how I use paper. This installation is called endearing. Endearing can refer to the to a dual meaning of tolerating a painful situation or being resilient. Here there is a delicate balance between vulnerability and protection. The two traveling trunks stand together symbolizing strength and preservation. The leather fringe spills out to the ground evoking a sense of journey and movement, presence and dignity. It also gives the trunks a figure-like presence. Similar to the protection series, I chose to leave out the, the heavy geometric symbols that previously resided in my work as a way of safeguard, safeguarding our stories, our bodies, and our belongings. Porcupine quills are intricately stitched on the smaller ends of the vessels in checkered and row patterns that reflect land and bring attention to the lack of identifiable uh, symbols on the larger faces. Although paper is seen as fragile and delicate, once built up in thick layers, the material reveals, reveals strength much like the human spirit. Here are details of the sharp and exposed quills. While driving between residencies, I came across a porcupine, unfortunately, on the side of the road. After collecting the quills, I thought about how I thought about the Lakota story of how the porcupine received its quills. In Lakota lore, the trickster deity known as Iktomi, or the spider, one day watched the porcupine defend itself by tying sharp branches to its back. Impressed by this, Iktomi gave the porcupine its quills to protect itself from danger from the danger of predators. Quill work is one of the oldest practices of adornment used by many peoples across present day US and Canada. The traditional practices of quill work held high, high trade value and required skill to produce fine designs and intricate and initiated societies of master quillers. This practice continues to thrive to this day and has always been unique to the Americas pre-settlers. I am not a, a, I'm not a quiller, a master quiller, but I chose to use the quills as they were intended for the porcupine. I achieved this by first cleaning the quill, then simply bending them and stitching directly to the paper with needle and thread. This is a more recent body of work called On the Back Road. Uh, this particular piece is titled the old place by number four, which I'll get more into. While navigating between Mass Mocha's Assets for Artists and the Vermont Studio Center residencies, I found myself on the East Coast. I realized the further I was away from the familiar scape I was embedded with, the more I wanted to bring home into my work. I was eager to explore mold making and casting in order to evolve the paper medium into more organic forms. My intention here was to infuse the paper with natural pigments, dyes of colors that again reinforced the, the spaces I was familiar with. I began this new process by adopting new tools like an industrial mixer to pulp lar larger amounts of paper and a preservation method, a practice reminiscent of hide smoking where smoke acts as a sanitizer and a sealant. Enclosed in a, tar enclosed in a tarp and exposed to burning sage, the paper absorbs the cleansing properties of the smoke, leaving an ephemeral scent. But this is, but this is done when the, the work is dry. 
A significant part of this work was the involvement of my mother, who kindly wor worked with me in collecting recycled paper by shredding it and then shipping it to me from Pine Ridge, the reservation. I won't get too much detail of my mom's work, but um, she does work for um, the health service on the reservation, and part of her work is their um, they're constantly getting rid of uh, paper, shredding and getting rid of paper, and she kindly um, yeah, shipped it to me. Using the industrial mixer, I blend the shredded paper articles into a water pulp and carefully remove excess liquid by pouring or slabbing the pulp over a mesh mold. You can see this being done in the image on the left. Panels in sculpture take form as I forge marks and layers by pressing the pulp by hand. On the right is a, is a sample piece during an attempt of casting over a mold, casting paper over a mold. I did not, I, I used, I did this by using drywall tape and chicken fencing to create a structure um, less flat than what I'm used to working with. Although I did not go um, much further in this process, I did see the remnants of the elk teeth as I was pressing the paper by hand with my fingers. While the paper is wet, I am able to shape the material and embed the surface before allowing the pulp to harden. The short fibers from the mixed pulp bonds together as it dries and becomes a thick solid structure. As I was working and building up the material on the flat bed molds, I, I began making marks with my fingers. Part of my printmaking background, cool work and beadwork practices began to come in. It resonated with the pressure, rhythm, and intent of these processes. This detail is what kept me moving through the new process of working with paper. Making my own marks kept me grounded to the work and informed me about the material, what the material was capable of. The impression of my fingerprints gave room to add other materials like bead, beeswax and embed the wax with sage, creating poetic fragments of adornment. Speaking of grounded, this, this became my most recent body of work called On the Background, Back Road in 2023. I explored and traced my personal roots of living on the res, reservation, uh, thinking about family stories of, of places that I don't remember all the time and simply reflecting on memories. This is an this is an intimate exploration of personal narr narratives filled with curiosity, imbued with indigenous intimacies and transform transformed materials. The discarded fragments repurposed into a medium carries the narratives that arise as I'm traveling and living in new spaces. By far, these are the thickest sheets of paper I've, I've made. Uh, they're super heavy, but again, they, they are solid and structurally strong. I believe most of these are an, about an inch thick of layered paper. I, I utilize sweetgrass dye, ash, and India ink to get these colors or tones. Because, of, because, of these, because these sculptures physically held more weight and were mo much larger than the pre uh, previous trunks that I've made, it made sense to present them um, on the floor and be grounded. To end my presentation, the work on the background is a testament to healing, growth, and renewal. It invites viewers to navigate the sculptural landscapes, engage with the tactile narratives, and reflect on their own paths of transformation. 
The works symbolize time, stories, and experience like the elements deeply embedded in each of us. These vessels or traveling trunks carry our stories and protect our memories. Thank you. I just want to again thank everyone who put this together and thank you so much Michaela we have a bag of RISD stuff for you, thank you. Um, we appreciate you coming here and we're gonna do a Q&A portion so we'll have a microphone um, so raise your hand if you have a question Hello, thank you Hi. for your presentation yeah. and thanks again to everybody who put this together. Um, at the end there you were talking about, um, I think you said yeah, the further away you were from home, the more you wanted to bring home into the work and I really, yeah, it was, also, it was really great hearing that and I, even it kind of showed up in how you were making particularly this idea, it looked like home became like multi-sensorial in a way, right? How you were saying that there was, it wasn't just about like showing home, but this sort of like idea that keeps you grounded. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about like why the feel of home, like not just like showing home, right? But it seems like there's something more than just like the looking that matters for you and really the further away you are from home, like making sure that that like feel is consistent. Um, but thank you in general for the presentation. And yeah, home, feel, wherever you want to take it. Uh, yeah, for me, a lot of it, I think, was really about the material itself. Um, so I mentioned that I, the, the like yellow dye that you see in the image on on the paper, in, they were uh, used. I used sweet grass, which is which came from, which came from um, home, and so it was all about like where, what made. I guess it was just the material because I collected it from home. Um, not, of course, not the India ink, but like the ash, all of those aspects came from home. And again, the mark making that I was doing, like even, you know, the, these simple marks that were of like my fingers being impressed into the paper, again, reminded me of home. Because like the dress in the um, first body of work that I showed, or the first installation, like all of those motifs, all of those reminded me of home because those were those are like images that I see when I what I kind of grew up with, and that dress that I showed, I actually have a similar dress. It's a little small. I like I had one from when I was a little baby, so I have a little mini one. Um, yeah, so it's just like things like that. Thanks. Hi there, um, thank you so much for speaking. Um, I loved seeing your breath of work and just seeing kind of, you know, where it started off, um, just in terms of its raw medium, but then yeah. um, thinking about it um, as like layers of embodied knowledge, mm. um, you know, generationally and culturally. Um, I was wondering um, if you could talk more about, um, I guess, the meaning of the materials um, in relation to them, the totality, like what can, um, like the strength of them being you know, this um, accumulation of a variety of materials, like um, if you could just speak more to like the strength of them like all together, like how that kind of like changes um, and strengthens each of like the little links that you've kind of like learned along the way. Um, and if you see that as like, um, yeah, just, just the transitional relationship between that. Uh, like how they all kind of come together yeah, how collectively. They, like, come together, form a um, meeting, but like also, you know, might um, resonate with people that might not have the same relationship. With mm -mm. That. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of it is really stems from kind of this idea, at least culturally, with where I come from. Um, like I mentioned, I think in one of the slides that you know everything gets used. 
um, every, you know, because like living off the land, we live off of all parts of the animal. Every part of it gets used. And I think that that's kind of where a lot of that, the material comes into play for me is like, um, cause I work, paper is so accessible, um, especially recycled paper. Like people are constantly throwing paper away all the time. And so that relationship to that really reminds me of that. And that's kind of where that comes in. So paper, like it being like the main medium because it's so accessible. Um, but also embedding like these other materials that I wouldn't be able to like, um, use like excessive amounts of it versus the paper itself because it's so um it's something that like it's it's like a lot of other trash that gets <laughs> flooding the world you know um yeah I don't know if I answered that correctly but that's kind of what I'm thinking thank you thanks hi thank you so much for your presentation um all the work you made was so rich in color and detail and material. Thanks. I wanted to ask, um, in the beginning, uh, what was the reason for your use of laser cutting uh, in, uh, compared to a different modes of mark making and cutting? Um, and do you see yourself returning to it in your future work? Um, a lot of that work, a lot of that work I did in school because I had a lot of access to it. Um, I think originally I started using it because um, I couldn't think of any other way to make marks on the paper. Um, also, because the paper is recycled, it's not an it's it's so far from the natural material. Um, it's actually really hard to make unless it's like an embossment, it's really hard to make prints on the paper. Uh, one of the pieces I showed early on, um, I, I don't wanna flick through, um, I had did ink over it, um, cause I was having a hard time making dark marks on it without like drawing or painting on it. Um, and I thought burning looked really nice. Um, yeah, and going back to it, I would definitely would like to, but it's just a matter of having access. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. It was really cool seeing all your work. Um, one of my questions was, um, while you were talking about your work, I noticed that there's like a lot of emphasis on like tactility mm. and like f um, just like something tactile, something tangible. And um, I feel like in museum spaces, a lot of times there's a lot of like clinicalness or like a detaching from the original culture, or from like the original context. And also how you were talking about like the Lakota dress and how it like caught your eye mm -hmm. and also how it was sort of like presented in a way that wasn't the original context and that in which it was supposed to be used. And so I was just kind of wondering if you could talk a bit more about that connection or like how sort of like bringing tactility back into a museum space or a mm -hmm. contemporary space. Yeah. Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think from from a working perspective of I think touching having access to actually filling and filling the material um, I think that that is something that is really hard with museum and collection work um, a lot of the time we don't necessarily get to fill it with our hands a lot of the time that the material doesn't get to to get touched by humans anymore. I mean, there are like reasons for that, of course. It could be like there's chemicals on it, um, a variety of things, but I think one thing is, um, I think just having, I don't know, there's a lack of limit, I think, on it for sure. And yeah, I don't know if I answered that. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Hi, 
Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, throughout your the, throughout your presentation, you talk about home a lot and you talk mm -hmm. about place a lot. And I know that you grew up um, in South Dakota and then you went to school in Arizona and now you're on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you have, I don't know if advice is the right word, but as a native person who's away from home and as a native artist who's away from home, how do you cope with being so far away and how does that affect your practice? I think that's why in my work I put it in my work a lot because I'm able to like physically, I'm working and I can think about home all the time you know like so that's why it's like I'm always trying to pull from home um, and I think that like as a student from a student perspective I definitely wow. like early on I mentioned my grandma I thought about my grandma a lot and how like she's overcome a lot of stuff especially going to boarding school and things like that you know like kind of being forced to have to be away from home versus the option I guess um, I did, whenever I was a student, I did a lot of journaling, writing a lot about home and how, um, I don't know, like my education really does matter. Um, yeah, I think, I hope that was helpful. Hello, um, thank you so much for such like a textured and valuable presentation of mm -hmm. your work. Um, I'm just very curious about like maybe your future projections and your projects. Um, like what specifically? Yeah, just like, I don't know. Like <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, recently, I've been really, uh, I don't know if you know the artist, um, Wongechi Mutu. Uh, she's an Afri African artist. Um, I've really been into her work recently, and I notice a lot of her sculptures include um, dirt. Um, and so that's kind of one thing I'm interested in bringing into my work now, hopefully, soon. Um, again, going back to casting, hopefully, hopefully too. I wasn't doing, I didn't do really great at it before, but I definitely am going to try to tackle it again. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my question is a little bit twofold. I guess um, on one hand, I was wondering if you would be willing to share kind of like the beginning story, like why did you become an artist? Um, what was your motivation? I mean, you showed images of your grandmother. Seems like that was a very informative um, part of your life and maybe reasoning. But I'm just curious if you wanted to share a little bit more about that, like why become an artist? And then the other side of that would be, I guess, the kind of like the end story is maybe um, Maybe you could articulate the um, the mission of your practice. Like, why are you an artist today? What do you find? Yeah. Uh, I think early on, when I was coming out of high school, um, you know, when you're finishing high school, they always get like, what are you going to do? You're going to go to college, blah, blah, blah. Um, I couldn't figure it out because my family is actually, my family comes from a very military background. And that's totally the opposite of me. Um, and that's not something I wanted for myself, uh, especially because I, I saw how, what that did to my family, um, which was super negative. Um, so I think going into art, choosing art as what I wanted to do, is it really informed me about who I was culturally, um, which I didn't get to fully grow up understanding because um, my my family went to boarding also was like my grandma like I mentioned was forced to go to boarding school so coming out of boarding school she was Christianized and through that she still spoke Lakota language but she, we didn't I didn't really get to grow up with stories being told by her like our traditional stories so that's kind of what got me into art because as, as I was a young artist, I started learning more and more about that. And then going forward as an artist, I think that still applies. I think still kind of learning about who I am culturally, but also how can I, how can I do that in contemporary spaces?
Thank you. <laughs> So thank you for keeping up with me. This is my first time doing a really big talk. Um, thank you. You're here for the first one, yeah. Cool.